Do you think that is a fair argument? Well, what I'm going to argue is that what you just said is fundamentally unchristian in the sense that you're saying that everyone is supposed to imitate Jesus. And the basic conceit of, from what I understand, uh, speaking with Christian theologians, is that we are fundamentally incapable of taking on our own sin. And so we have to have somebody who comes in the form of Christ on earth in order to accept that suffering for us. And that that is the purpose of God actually embodying himself in Christ, is to provide human beings the capacity to withdraw from original sin. That we don't actually have the capacity beyond a certain point to overcome. And that's why Jesus as a singular figure is necessary. I actually agree from a Judaic point of view with everything that you say, because for me it's about accepting the responsibility for my own sins on myself, and I don't have the ability to say that there is the, the suffering servant, the suffering Lamb of God, who sacrificed himself to relieve me of my sins, mm -hmm. and therefore give me a fair shot at life. Yeah, well, uh, okay, so okay, that's a, that's a really good objection, I think, and I think that there's a fair bit of confusion about that in the Christian community, for example, so I would say that that perspective is more explicitly Protestant and then, then I would put the Catholics next to that, but then I would put the Orthodox types fairly far away from that, which is why so many Orthodox Christians, I think, have been interested in what I'm saying, because their sense, and this is where my knowledge of Christian theology starts to run out, because it's like I'm not an expert, I'm, you know, in the, in the doctrinal differences. Right. Um, their sense is that it's the imitation that's of primary importance. Now, it's, it's a weird thing, because even in classical Christianity, you have, let, let's say, Protestant Christianity, you have this idea that, well, Christ died to save us all from our sins, and so we're already redeemed. But that doesn't alleviate the moral burden, weirdly enough, because you think it should. So there's this paradox, and I think it's, I, I think part of the reason for that, uh, this, is, this is an extraordinarily complicated thing. But... Now, that was Ben Shapiro and Dr. Jordan Peterson. They were discussing many different topics, but in the midst of the topics, they were trying to bring up the differences between Christianity and Judaism. And they both seem to be confused because they both, the only middle ground that they seem to find in that is, and they speak on it just a little bit more, was how Jesus taught works and belief in him, trust in him, love in him, reliance on him. Ben seems to have it a whole lot more figured out than Jordan Peterson, in whom claims to be a Christian. Um, Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, so right there you say, well, that means keep the commandments, right? Verse 21, in that same chapter, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. He that hath my commandments, he says. I wrote a book a few years ago that I have since stopped selling. You may can still buy it. But I have stopped selling it personally, and I called it Once Saved, Always Saved, Satan's Greatest Trick. The reason why I stopped selling is because I taught a works-based salvation. Now, I was saved at the time, but I did not know the scriptures. So, once that I had finally figured out that it's, it's all about faith, it's all about belief and reliance and love of God and solely relying upon Him and His work on the earth and not our own i stopped selling it but many denominations have been split over this i know many well-meaning uh christian brothers and sisters that still teach that if you do bad works then you'll lose your salvation but then if you ask them 
Well, how are you saved? Well, we're saved by grace through faith. Well, then how do you lose it by works? If you're, see, it's, there's a contradiction in there. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. This is a very controversial subject. The Bible is very clear on how to teach it. It's amazing to me how such intellectually gifted minds like Jordan Peterson can't grasp this, but I get it. And it kind of goes back to what Jesus said. He thanked the Father because he revealed truth unto the babes. He revealed truth unto those in whom aren't smart in and of themselves, like moi, and, and not unto the wise and prudent. He didn't reveal this truth to these guys. But I can show you very clearly, and I will today, on how we are commanded. We are, comm we, we are given commandments, but the commandments are to believe it's, it's the law of faith. It's not the law of Moses. It amazes me how Ben Shapiro and Dennis Prager, who said it plainly himself, Dennis Prager said, Christians have faith and we Jews have works. We believe in works. So they, 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 the Jews still cling to the law of Moses. And I'm going to try to show that just right here in just a second, how that was meant for the Jews in the days of Moses. And up until the time of Christ. That, that is no longer, that's the old covenant, okay? Now there are certain truths held within that covenant that point to Christ that are eternal and they're everlasting. But as for the works themselves, and we'll get to the works just right here in just a second. First John 2, 3 and 4, John writes, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So right there we're told, keep the commandments, keep the commandments. Well, what's the commandments? We'll get to that. 1 John 3, 24, he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Even in Revelation, this is noted, this keeping of the commandments. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. One can see how the teaching to the church to keep his commandments is clear in scripture. But are, the, are these the commandments of the Old Testament? Everything under the law of Moses, which number over 600, it amazes me how people say, well, you got to keep the Ten Commandments. Even whenever you get saved, you got to keep the commandments. That's the commandments Christ is talking about, and you got to keep them. That's not the commandments Christ are talking that, that he's talking about. It's not at all. The Ten Commandments are a part. It's in Exodus 20. And whenever you take the Ten Commandments into your salvation, into what you should do in accordance with salvation and how to keep your salvation and all this that they teach and that I used to, you have to take what's written before and after that because there, that's not the only commandments given. There are 613 documented commandments in the Old Testament in the Law of Moses, not just those 10. Right here are just a few of them. The Jews, they take this. So if you take the, the Ten Commandments, if you're works-based salvation, even if you're a Christian, if you say, well, I believe that the Ten Commandments are part of our salvation that we should still keep them, well, then you also have to keep these others. To have one, to have children with one's wife, to purchase a Hebrew slave in accordance with prescribed law, to redeem Jewish maidservants, the master must not sell his maidservant, the courts must carry out the laws of an unpaid guard, the court must not let a sorcerer live, not to curse the head of state or leader of the Sanhedrin, not to eat meat of an animal that was mortally wounded, not to let the Canaanites dwell in the land of Israel, to burn incense every day if you're a Levite, for the head of the Levites that was given unto Aaron, just to keep the Sabbath. There are basic commandments that can't be, you're not allowed to water plants, you're not allowed to ha handle money from 
the Friday evening all the way through to Saturday evening. You have to keep the Sabbath now if you want to keep the commandments. You got to keep the Sabbath. Now you can't kindle a fire, which means that you can't cook. You can't um, you can't start a car unless in case of emergency. You can't use your phone unless in case of emergency. You can't use any electricity in case unless in case of an emergency. You can't have sex. You can't do. There's tons of things, especially no working. You're not allowed to do anything. It even goes so far as to you're not supposed to cut your hair or to pluck a gray hair out of your head you're not supposed to you get there's certain other traditions that you have to be kept to which is the, like washing your hands in a certain manner there's all kinds of commandments of the old testament you can't just pick and choose which ones that you believe should be applied to salvation you have to either group them all or you have to say that's the old covenant and i'm going to show that's the old covenant right here very plain as day paul the apostle says in romans 7 1 through 6 Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which is the passions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And in Romans 6, 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Those who are born, to put it very simply, those who are born are under the law once they reach the age of accountability. You're under the law immediately upon the age of accountability because you don't have any knowledge of sin up until that point. You don't know that you're sinning and angering God and that you're doing something wrong against God. So those who are born are under the law. Those who are reborn in the spirit are under grace. Those who are only in the flesh are under the law. If those in whom have no spirit awaken them, then they are restrained, restricted, and imprisoned and enslaved by the flesh. Therefore, they're judged under the law because the law was given in order to condemn men. Those who are alive in the spirit are under grace. The distinction is found in the attitude toward strangers and family. Once that you were born in the spirit, God is a spirit, and Jesus spoke in the spirit, spiritual terms, we're born now into the newness of spirit. Once that you are spiritually reborn, you become a member of the family of God. So Ken Hoban does, he has a very good analogy. If, if, a, if two kids are outside playing baseball and if one of them hits the ball and it goes and it breaks one of my windows, if that boy be my son, then it becomes, it's a family matter, okay? And I deal with him. He's still my son, still a member of the family. He's made me mad, but he's still a member of the family. Now, if the neighbor kid does it, if he hits a ball and it goes through my window, then it becomes a legal issue and it has to go to the courts and the law has to deal with it then. Far different circumstances, far different punishment. The kid could go to jail or whatever, I don't know, fined or something. He's penalized. Whereas my son, he's judged by me and I get on to him and then we go about our normal day. That's grace. Okay. I show grace into my son, whereas I wouldn't a neighbor kid. It's the same way with between the law and grace. Second Corinthians three, six, God hath made us able ministers of the new Testament not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. So the Old Testament law kills a man, right? How? How does the Old Testament law kill a man? Galatians 3.10 tells us, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You're cursed if you're under the law, because you're going to break the law. 
If you live under the Ten Commandments, you must obey all ten at all times because if you break one, according to James 2.10, then you broke them all. You're just as guilty as a murderer, an adulterer, a blasphemer, and so forth if you lie one time. James 2.10, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. The Old Testament commandments were strictly meant for the Israelites of that day, strictly meant for the Hebrew people of that day. The oldness in their references testify to this. It speaks clearly of not allowing sorcerers to live, not selling your maidservant, uh, laws concerning the unpaid guards, Jewish maid servants, Hebrew, Hebrew slaves prescribed in the prescribed law, keeping them as it is, not to let the Canaanites dwell in the land of Israel, not to eat meat of an animal that is mortally wounded. The head of state shall not be disrespected, nor the Sanhedrin. It's a clearly antiquity that they're speaking in terms of. That's an, in, that's an old, that's old time. It's very much in the past, okay? And so that it perplexes me that they still try to keep these laws of Moses whenever both of them, you don't even have to, just, no maid servants anymore. Just, you don't have to worry about the Canaanites coming in. The Canaanites were of old. You know, now, now they're dealing with the descendants of Persia and some of them say um, Ishmael, Egyptians, and whatnot. It's so, it's strictly an old old law given to the old old people of that law but because they choose to establish their own righteousness through their works it is written in second corinthians three fourteen: the jews minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the old testament which veil is done away in christ so if these old testament laws no longer apply to us under grace then what are the commandments that Jesus spoke of and that Paul taught us about and that John teaches on? And that, well, what are these commandments that's, talk, that's talked about in Revelation and that's throughout the New Testament? What are these commandments then? Many denominations have been created. They, they've been split up over this one issue. It's very clear. It's very plain as day. I don't see how people miss it. Uh, 1 John 3, 22 and 23. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Whenever they ask Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He says, love God and love your, love your brother, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. Now your neighbor is the good Samaritan, that's your brother. Okay, that's not the world. That's your brethren. We're commanded to love the world. We're also told to love our enemies, but that's in regarding rewards. Okay, that's not that's not a commandment. Jesus says, for what reward have you if you only love those in whom love you? Love your enemies. Okay, so if you want a lot of rewards, love your enemies. But um, a huge crowd inquired of Jesus in Capernaum, asking him in John 6, 28, what shall we, what shall we do? For all of you who do want to work a lot for God, if you really have such a zeal that you wish to work all the time, and let me let me say something real quick, and I'm not boasting. I have many good works. I'm not against good works. I love good works. We're saved unto good works. We're supposed to do good works, but if we don't do good works, that has no, that doesn't count towards our salvation. You can be a very evil Christian and die because God will. He promises that. You'll be rendered over to Satan, taken out, and then you'll, your soul will be saved in that day. But you'll have no works, and we'll get to that right here in just a second. You'll have no, um, no rewards in heaven. But um, I, you, you're not hearing this from a guy who has no good works. I have many good works, and I've, I've put a lot of blood, sweat, tears. I try to go just live my life solely for God. I do this all the time. But I live in a, in a way of faith. I live in a way of I love Jesus. And I see that eternal time coming. And I try, I try to keep be conscious of that all the time. I want to be conscious of that. I don't want to let that go in order to do things that are evil and to do things that please the world. Now, that doesn't mean I'm sinless. We all sin. Any man who says that he doesn't sin is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Now, I do sin. 
but I love Christ so much that it's not in me to want to do that, okay? But if you do fall into sin as a Christian, don't expect your life to, to be much longer. You will die early. I guarantee that. That's happened many, many, I've seen that happen personally. But anyway, for all of you in whom wish to do works of God, what's the greatest work of God? What shall we do that we might work the works of God, they asked Jesus. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Believe. John 6.40 says this, And this is the will of him that sent me, Jesus says, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at that last day. Everyone that seeth and believeth in me. He's not saying anyone who goes out and does more works. Look, Plenty of atheists do a lot of uh, philanthropic works. They go out and they feed the poor, they feed the widows. They have all kinds of good works, tons of them. They give millions and millions of dollars to doing good works. They're trying to work their way to heaven, much like the Jews of today, the unbelieving Jews. But that's not what Christ came down here for, and that's not what gets you to heaven. That is not salvation, because we can't do enough good works to get there. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He didn't say he who does the most good works shall live, even if he's dead. He says he that believeth in me, he that trusts in me, he that loves me, he that is for me. He, he says he that believeth in me. Notice, no mention of works or other commandments whatsoever. No other mention. And whosoever, Jesus continued telling Martha, liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? He didn't say, go ahead and go on to that. Do you remember how he was teaching and Mary was at his feet? Martha's sister Mary was at his feet. Martha was up cleaning, doing all kinds of works and works and works. And Jesus complimented Mary for just listening to him. He said, no, she's doing things that are eternal. You're doing things. And he says, Martha, Martha. It's all you're doing. You're just working, working, working. He says, this, what I'm telling you, is so much better for you. Hey, this thing, the dishes will get dirty again. He says, I'm telling you something that'll clean you forever. I'm not speaking on sinlessness. I'm talking about perfection in the spirit. Okay? It said, no, that's another topic that I can easily get into later on. Jesus also said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But him that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It doesn't say him who's the most evil, him who's, we're all evil, okay? We're all sinners, but some are saved by grace, and those are the ones that get to heaven. You'll see a lot, if you go to hell, you'll see an awful lot of nice people down there. A lot, awful lot of people who did a lot of great works, a lot probably better works than Christians as far as men are concerned. Not one mention of works, only faith. That's all Jesus ever taught. Paul, every, every one of them taught it. James, in the book of James, the only time you'll see it, it's mentioned, and Paul mentions works. Like I said before, he says, you're saved unto good works. But whenever it comes, you're, you're saved in order to do good works. Now, if you don't have those good works, you're still saved, all right? But you'll be taken out. That's, that is the teaching of the, of the Bible. James merely says that if you have the true faith, what James does in his book, he's not talking necessarily about salvation. He's talking about, because he says faith without works is dead. He's talking about true confession, true faith over a false confession. He says, if you don't have the real faith within you, because even the demons believe and tremble, remember. Okay, so they're you just saying, Lord, Lord, in that day is not gonna do much. And notice whenever they say, Many come up to me and say, Lord, Lord, in that day, and they say, have we not exercised demons in thy name? And in thy name, have we not done many wonderful works? They end their saying with works. They're all about works. Jesus has no, they, they, they have nothing to do with Christ. He says, depart from me, ye who worketh iniquity. 
because their sins are remembered in that day. We're about to get to that. Paul the Apostle made this crystal clear in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of works. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And in Romans 3, 27, 28, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, meaning without works. You're justified by faith. And in Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Many men who teach a works-based salvation will quote Titus 1.16. I used to use Titus 1.16 constantly, and I take it immediately out of context. You can do this with Bible all over the place. But it says in this, and I've heard preachers who preach a works-based salvation teaching this. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. You say, well, right there, it teaches you bad. You can send your way out of grace. It, it, I'm to, they profess that they know God. They say, Lord, Lord, but in works they deny him. Whoa, wait a minute. Who's he talking to? Who's Paul talking to? In the verse right before that, I'll read 15 and 16, not just 16. I'll read both. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They, the unbelieving, profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. Paul is speaking to the unbelievers. Those not in the faith are under the law and are doomed to be judged by all their works. Now, let me, let me just teach this, okay? Revelation 20, 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. This is the great day of judgment, the great white throne judgment. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, according to 2 Corinthians 5 through 5 verse 10, we're all going to be judged by our works. All of us are going to be judged by our works. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So all men will be judged by all their works. The difference is, is that Jesus takes away our sins, all the faithful, all the believing, all those who trust and love him. He takes our sins from us, but our good works remain, okay? Our good works remain, and we're saved and rewarded for those. The bad, Jesus says, uh, that our sins, God says in the Old Testament, he says, I'll cast them as far as the east is from the west, which is limitless. He says, they're just as, he says, I'll remember them no more. He doesn't say I'll forget them. He says, I'll remember them no more. If you forget something, you can remember it again. But if you remember it no more, you don't remember it anymore. So our sins are cleansed because of Christ. The unbelieving world's sins remain on them, condemning them. Our sins, our, our works are rewarded. Their works are their condemnation. Okay? That's the difference. Paul wrote in Romans 2.12, As many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law, meaning those attempting to attain their own righteousness yet fail. Okay, so as many as have sinned in the law, those attempting to attain their own righteousness, yet fail in it, shall be judged by the law. And any man found under the law, that is all who rely in any way upon their own works, in any way, are under a curse, according to Galatians 3.10. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Just as your works have nothing to do with you gaining your salvation, your works have nothing to do with you keeping it or losing it or whatever you say that, that it happens. I, I don't believe that a man can lose it. I don't. That's a works-based salvation. 
that's not Bible. It's not scriptural. It's not in the Bible. I've read it every word. It's not in there. And that's what my entire first book was all about. The good works of the unbelievers are as filthy rags before God. Isaiah 64, 6 tells us. The good works of the unbelievers, they count for nothing in that day. In the same manner, the evil works of the faithful will cause them to suffer loss regarding their rewards. As first as first Corinthians states, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he, him, he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Okay? So whenever we're judged based upon our good works, whether they be gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hair, stubble, meaning what's the quality of the good works? What's the reverberating effect? Why did we do them? How did we do them? Did we do them with a full heart or was it self-serving? Who did we do them for? What, you know, there's all kinds of variables that go into play according to, in, in regarding our, our good works that we'll be rewarded for. But some shall suffer loss on that day. We're told about that. If any man's word shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Okay? So many may not have any good works on that day. You, a lot of, I know a lot of Christians that are uh, pretty, uh, pretty fickle. But then we're also told about repentance. You'll hear an awful lot of people say, well, what about repent? It says repent and believe. John Baptist starts out the ministry of the kingdom of God. He says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus says, repent in numerous times. But what of repentance you say? What about repentance? Doesn't that mean turning away from your sins? Doesn't that mean that you have to be sinless afterwards? This is one of the most convoluted, twisted scriptures that I've ever seen in my entire life. Ever. They often will get what faith really is wrong and they'll get what repentance means wrong. And there's a lot of other things they'll get wrong as well. But I'm talking about good Christians that are um, theologians and so forth, scholarly type. But they get the word repentance wrong. And this is a very important, clear, distinctive topic. This, is, this carries great significance on what you think repentance really means. Because this is where works base comes in. Okay, well, it says we repent and then believe, and that's it, okay? Repentance in the Greek used in the Greek word used there is metanoeo. Metanoeo. And it means literally to think differently. It's a change of mind. To think differently. Now it's referring to your mind, right? Paul clarifies this in Romans 7. At the very end of the chapter in Romans 7, read it with me, and you'll find out exactly the state of what true repentance is. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He goes on, this is repentance. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind, to think differently, so then with the mind, a change of mind, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, the law of faith, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You will sin. You say, no, that's not repentance. Repentance means you turn away from your sins and you never sin that sin ever again. If you do, you have to keep repenting and repenting and repenting. It's a change of mind is what it is. You hate that sin. Even whenever you do it, in that very same context, Paul says, the sin that I do, I do, and it's the sin within me that's doing it. He says, that which I would do, that which I hate, I do. He says, and that which I would do, I do, and that which I, or that which I wouldn't do, I do, and that which I would do, I don't do. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. He says, I can't get away from this sin. He says, I keep sinning, but he hates it. With his mind, he serves God. He says that clearly. With my mind, I serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. And he said, right before that, he says, I thank Jesus for the, I thank him because I can't get away from sinning. It's, repentance is not about stopping sin necessarily. It means that you change your mind regarding that sin. A lot of times it leads to you stopping that sin. It, it's, a lot of times it does, but sometimes it will not, and you'll live in perpetual misery. I speak from experience. You'll live in perpetual misery the entire time. 
It will leave you feeling empty and completely void of a relationship with God. It is not good to sin, nor am I saying that you should be free to sin. Use not your liberty as an excuse to sin. That's, that's not a good thing. You will find that it will not be a very good life on this earth. I guarantee you that. The Old Testament prophet Habakkuk wrote this very same thing regarding faith to the his Jewish brethren who were under the law. He was under the law at that time, but he knew about faith and grace. He knew where it really lied. He said, because Abraham believed God. He had faith in God. He trusted God and was called thereby a friend of God. There, thereby was righteousness imputed unto him. That's what Christ does. He gives us his righteousness. He paid the sin debt for us because we can't do it through our works. Habakkuk said to his brethren, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Many years later, Paul the Apostle reminded his Christian, Christian brethren of this truth when he wrote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, what's he talking about? For it is the power of God, the gospel of Christ, unto salvation to everyone that believeth. I am not ashamed to believe in this, he says. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith, not by works. That is not how you're going. Now, you'll have good works. Once again, I'm telling you, do good things. You'll want to do good things. And those who have this works-based salvation, the Jews believe they have to do them. But us Christians want to do them. It's a spiritual change. Put no trust in your own works, but love the Son. For whosoever loveth the Son loves the Father. And the Holy Ghost abides in you. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. All is now under love. Under grace, it's under love. It's a family matter. That's why you love your family, love your family, love your family. You we're all a big family. To believe Jesus is to trust him. To trust him is to love him. God is love. If you truly love the son and the brethren, you will have good works. For we are saved by grace through faith unto good works but all is under faith. So we're saved by grace through faith unto good works. Okay, so we're supposed to do good works, but if you don't have good works, you'll still be saved in that day, but you'll, you'll have nothing, you'll suffer loss. All is under faith. Jesus said to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Do we overcome by our own strength? Our own works by the Ten Commandments? Is that how we overcome the world? Well, the Bible tells us how to overcome it. First John 5, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, love, and everyone that loveth him that begat, which is God, loveth him also that is begotten of him, which is Jesus. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous for whatsoever, now listen, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the son of God. You are commanded to love God and to love your brethren. And Jesus says, who will do the work of God? What do we do that we work the will of God? Tell us how to do the works of God. Jesus says, believe in him and whom he has sent. Jesus has never taught a works-based salvation. The New Testament, it does away with the old. You, you I Now learn the old, read the old. I've read it and I love reading the Old Testament. But we are not saved by the, by the works of the law. We are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. God of peace be with you all.